What's up, everybody? This is Jonah Davis, and I have the extremely handsome Mr. Joel Bletchinger here. And we are going to cruise with you guys for a bit. Uh, we're going to talk about strings, changing strings, different types of strings. And, you know, um, Joel is going to give us some tips on, on, on what to do and how to string. He's going to give us a demonstration. Uh, so I hope you guys join in, hang out, and have some fun with us. And how are you doing, bud? Awesome. Good. How are you, man? I'm doing Amen. good. I, I've been busy, but I've been loving it and no complaints dude no so but i'm i'm super happy to have you today dude i'm so glad um and you're gonna give us a demonstration on what to do with our ukulele strings and we're gonna talk ukulele strings so guys if you guys are listening watching right now if you guys have anybody that would like to know something about ukulele strings go ahead and share this uh as joel and i hang out as we talk ukulele as he shares some of his wisdom about stringing and gives us demonstrations demonstrations on how to string because one of the biggest questions that we have today is how do I restring my ukulele right and we're always trying to figure out how do we do it and we have the main man uh the man of ukulelic ukulele strings Joel Bletchinger here with us today and he is going to teach us how to change our strings all right my man I will let you take it away and Give us the wisdom. <laughs> All right. Sounds good. Well, I guess, yeah, before we even get into the restring, we can like go over, uh, you know, different uh, types of strings. Like uh, there's a lot of, there's a lot out there, different formulas, different brands, different, starting with a type of string. The strings that I use in the Ukelogic sets is a uh, fluorocarbon. So uh -huh. it's, you know, a fairly popular material out there. It's like a uh, worst strings, Fremont, um, you know, D'Addario makes, fluorocarbon um you, you can find it kind of across the board even in the classical guitar sets um in general that tends to be like the the brighter kind of crisper sounding string it's a more dense material compared to something like nylon so uh -huh. usually it you get a little bit more just kind of projection and clarity um in general uh whereas nylon is going to be a softer material the diameter is usually a little bit thicker relative to the amount of tension so you know, they may seem like, you know, bigger, beefier strings. A lot of people say that the the nylon strings that they're using are heavy, but it's a, uh, it can be a little bit of an illusion, like the mm -hmm. size to the diameter to tension ratio. So um, just keeping that in mind, like just on a formula level, nylon tends to be softer and because of that a little bit warmer and elastic and stretchy, whereas fluorocarbon is a little bit denser, a little bit more brittle, a little bit, uh, you know, that's why you get a little more crispness, a little more pop and action whenever you, uh, you know, compare them side by side. So there's not never a perfect right answer, but it's uh, these days, it seems like fluorocarbon's been picking up a lot of steam for the last, you know, seven or eight years. So a lot uh -huh. of players are using it and there's a lot of options for gauge and tension and everything. So you can find a set that's not only the sound you want, but comfortable to play. There's just a lot more options out there. So when we are, when we are using like fluorocarbon versus nylon, right now, okay, so it's a little bit more denser on the fluorocarbon side, right? Mm -hmm. So now if it is much more denser, how does that affect the action of our ukulele? So it's going to be a, uh... They're a smaller diameter relative to the tension, so you can usually get a little bit closer without having to worry about the the strings dipping down and clipping the frets quite as much. Uh -huh. It's still, you know, tension plays a part too because you can have a thin string, and if the a thin diameter string, and if you're using it in a for a tuning that is, like, say you're just some people drop the tuning down a bit, that's going to slack the string. So then when it's you know, when it's vibrating and oscillating, it's going to have a wider feel to it. Whereas if it's like nice and tight, it's going to be a little bit more in the middle. So the looser the string is, it's also going to need a little bit more space to vibrate. So it's it's all three of those things together. It's like size, tension, and, you know, just how much clearance you have over the frets. So you kind of got to take that into consideration. But since most sets are aiming to be, you know, a pretty common if you're using it for like traditional GCA tuning, uh -huh. usually the strings are going to be dialed in to, you know, fit somewhere in the middle, but just something to keep in mind if you ever like 
like to drop tuning or you know mess around with alternate tuning that's a uh, something you kind of got to consider either loosening a string that's a little bit on the lighter side or if you just want to jump up to a heavier gauge to compensate for the loss of tension that way you can kind of balance it out but that's all going to be a little bit of trial and error to to figure that out but in general fluorocarbon ends up usually not being quite as um buzzy for that reason with lower action as long as the you know the setup is good the frets the neck there's not any other barrier or obstacle into it you can usually get a little bit on the lower side and have like a nice tight uh clean action and uh don't have to worry so much about just larger strings getting in the way oh nice nice okay so now if i was just starting right so so much of our our people you know if we're just getting started playing the ukulele and we don't know what type of string to choose like what should i go for how should i determine whether i should use either fluorocarbon or nylon i tell people to base it on like try one thing pick one thing um usually it helps like to to get a recommendation just from somebody who knows either or just try what came on your instrument, but like get, try at least one thing out to get a frame of reference so that when yeah. you ask someone else for advice, you at least have something you've already used. And, you know, if they're familiar with the string, then they can kind of help base a decision off of that. Like when customers call me, there's a lot of, most imports these days use uh, Aquila strings, but even like higher end, like, uh, you know, Connie Leia uses Aquila strings. Um, then you got like Colt Lyle and Kamaka that are using some form of uh, nylon for the most part. It's like everybody, every manufacturer is going to kind of pick and choose what they think complements their instrument. But, um, you know, that doesn't mean it's the best choice for everybody. Just like, you know, even my, my strings aren't the best choice for everybody, but you don't know that until you do a little bit of just trial and error. So you need a jumping off point. Um, the biggest thing I'd say, like most, if you're just starting out, even if you don't know, you don't want if you don't know if you need a hard tension string you probably don't mm. so just start on the softer side because everybody the biggest thing everybody's worried about is comfort like even when it comes to setup like you want it to play comfortably so um if that's like your main concern then start off with something that is known to be like a lighter tension set um you know whether it's nylon or fluorocarbon mm -hmm. but then just give it a try and then just keep little keep notes so I tell people is like, even if it's just like a little notebook or just a piece of paper, or put a post-it on the set of strings so that once you install it, you have a post-it on there, you have the label. So you remember exactly what you put on uh -huh. and then just jot down some notes. Like, this is how it sounded to me. I did like, um, I like how these strings feel. This one string is a little too floppy. This one's a little too tight. This one sounds, you know, a little lifeless. This one has too much volume. Um, and like in the case of my strings, that usually means you can customize it. Like it can send you different gauges to mix and match and try to get it closer to where you want it. For other sets that are just prepackaged out of the market, that'll still help you know, like, you know, which direction to go. Cause some companies like, like Worth has a, a pretty big lineup. Mm -hmm. They're all prepackaged, but if you go through, uh, you can even go on their website and you look through, they have a spreadsheet and it lists every set and all the diameters of all the strings. Mm -hmm. So you can, you know, kind of look at that and, and get a reference like, okay, if this, if the E string on this set was the one that was giving me trouble and I just wish it was a little bit heavier, you can go on there, you can, you know, try to find one that fits the bill and, and then give that a try. And there's, there's going to be some, some stinkers or some like ones that yeah. you try out and you just really don't like it, but that's a, that's all kind of part of the game. Otherwise you just settle for what you have, but uh you know, it's like the right one is out there and it could even be different for all your instruments. Like you might find a set that's really comfortable that you like to play. Mm -hmm. sounds good on one instrument on this other one. It doesn't sound the same. So yeah. that's another thing. You might not just pick the same set for every instrument, but right. you know, a lot of people do like you find the set that feels perfect. I kind of did that with guitar strings. Like mm -hmm. I got the strings that I know that I like and I use them on almost everything, but once in a while, if we're a yeah. different tuning or a different instrument, like you want to use something else and i put on sets that i hated and i put on sets that totally surprised me and i loved it so yeah see and that's the thing too right like um that's another thing that most of our ukulele players don't realize is that you know 
what's good for one isn't good for all, right? Because every ukulele, uh, even if they're mass produced, you know, the honesty, the honest truth is that they all have their own voice. Yeah. You know, uh, it could, I mean, it's like core, right? How can everybody have the same type of wood, but yet every ukulele sounds different? You know right. what I mean? You know, and then, so I just know that, for example, like I love ukulajics. You know, I ever since I started using them, I put them on every single ukulele that I own. So, so far, and, you know, and I have quite a bit, right? You know, and, and I rotate my ukuleles every single day, literally. Um, and so they pretty much work on everything and they bring out the voice of every ukulele differently. And that's another cool thing about strings, right? Because you never know. And like you said, um, there are some ukuleles that I prefer the koaloha stock strings mm -hmm. that they use you know and so those ukuleles i keep the stocks on there you know what i mean because to me they just sound better but everything else has ukulajics um initially you know and i found it it's kind of like um you know you feel one way one day and you feel something else the next day so sometimes yeah. it's hard tension and you're just loving that sound and then all of a sudden, Saturday comes and you're like, eh, this one sounds better. I'm in the mood for this. Oh, so yeah. That's such a cool thing, you know, like to think about it, like actually like there's no right or wrong. And and I think I think sometimes we have a hard time getting over that part. You know what I mean? Like, oh, yeah. I should, you know, it's this and only this. But as musicians, as ukulele players, nothing stays the same. You know what I mean? And it's good that we treat our strings the same way. Yeah. Yeah. Like, you know, no, I think it's the same with instruments. You know, you can you can know you like. Why does everybody have so many different instruments? Like, if you liked, if you just wanted the same thing, you would just buy one and you would just play that instrument. You get different ones for different sounds, and like you said, you can use the same string set on different instruments, but they're still different instruments. So it's going to bring out different qualities out of all of them. Mm. So it's all, it's all the recipe too. Like you could even. I mean, you can have three players play the same instrument with the same strings. You can have them play the same song. It's going to sound a little different with all three of those playing it because everybody has their own little inflections and, you know, ways of, uh, you know, playing a song. Somebody using uh, fingernails versus someone using, like, the fleshy tips of their fingers, you're going to get two different sounds out of that, even mm -hmm. though you could be using the same setup, instrument, strings. So, yeah, it's – it's in. I think some people, like uh, – like the comfort of things staying the same yeah which is which is totally fine and some people are just really adverse to changing strings so they just want to find something that they like and stick with it and not have to i think some people get excited about doing like the the trial and error and then some people it's just it's a it, it's more of a chore or it's just more like intimidating trying mm -hmm. to go through it or know where to start and you know there's hundreds of string sets out there like it's and everybody has an opinion of what they like and what their favorite is and everybody is pretty you know, usually pretty vocal about what their favorites are. So unless you're trying to, you know, replicate somebody, you know, that you like, and, you know, that's usually the best way to go about it is just to kind of get a good idea, find somebody who you respect or who, you, you know, you like their playing or their, their setup, mm -hmm. and then try to replicate as much as you can get as close as you can and then tweak it from there. But uh, yeah. yeah, there's never, I still plenty of times I'll recommend different string sets in mind to customers if I just don't think it's going to be what they're looking for or and then on my instruments I switch up the strings all the time I'll just on a whim I like it's time to restring it I'll put something totally different on it just to see how it sounds for me it's like research at this point but it's also just it's just fun to try something something new and um kind of out of the box or because it kind of forces your playing to change a little bit too you know like mm. you might just having a different setup throws a little bit of novelty in there so that you might just kind of approach your playing in a different way and you can come up with some totally different stuff because you're either inspired by the different sound of it or, you know, the strings are easier to play. So now you can execute certain, you know, maneuvers that you wouldn't be able to do with the strings you were using before. Just there's a lot of possibilities. So it's just uh, if you don't mind going through the trouble of changing strings every so often and you know, just want to invest a little bit of money in getting like a, a sampler or just being okay with replacing strings. If you don't like them, just mm -hmm. rolling the dice a little bit, then that's the only real way to, to do it. Unless you just want to take somebody's word for it and then just, uh, commit. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome, bro. And that's a cool thing about strings. You know what I mean? 
there's no right or wrong and it's like anything you know what i mean i i like to say there's no right or wrong for anything yeah you know it's trial and error you know and that's the best way you learn as a musician as a ukulele player of any kind of just starting just being okay with trying things out yeah you know and that's the coolest thing about it all right my man so are you gonna you're gonna teach us some some stringing skills oh, yeah. some magic you're gonna learn us the ways of the string master <laughs> absolutely let's do it so this is using a tie bridge um i got another uh example of a, a pin bridge i can kind of show the way to do that then and uh i'll also work showing how to do it for string through bridges like if you have a romero or um you know a lot of custom builders use them but uh at least for the first example just stick with a tie bridge go over the basic like process and then how like attaching them to the tuner posts and then we can kind of go into the the variations of the bridge and different ways you can approach that mm. so um so for me the first thing is like slacking the strings off um some just get it slack enough that you can cut them. I know there's a lot of players that like to hold on to their strings just in case, you know, you want to salvage or reuse them, which is, right. you know, it's fine. You might, uh, if you are somebody who likes to do that, then um, the one thing I'd say is try to be extra careful whenever you put them back on another instrument because it's going to be crimped wherever it, you know, was tied on at the bridge or the tuners. If the if the string is kind of crimped and mangled and it's in front of the bridge or in front of the nut, that's usually going to throw it off balance and then you'll wind up with like buzzing issues and stuff. So it's not always the easiest thing uh, recouping the strings, but um, you know, if you do do it and you're like really delicate about putting them back on, usually you can kind of get them close to the same spot without, uh, you know, having all those issues, but um, it comes up enough that I thought I'd, I thought I'd mention it because some people do. They ask us to leave the original strings on before we replace the old ones. Ah, I see. But um, yeah. So you can not. I don't would necessarily recommend the drill bit uh, attachment for everybody unless um, you know you feel confident. But you can break strings pretty easy when you're tightening it. Mm. If you just zoom that thing, or if the if this thing, especially Koalohas, because they got that little flare out, if you got this thing pushed in too much, you're going to end up clipping it and you can take a little chunk out of the, the corner there. So, um, yeah, don't be afraid to. For years, I did it by hand. My old boss, he didn't uh, trust us with the drill initially. And <laughs> so he would do it all by hand. So I got really good at um, doing two at once and just nonstop twisting the knobs. But, uh, I think pretty much everybody's got string winders now, but you can yeah. always do it by hand. You don't necessarily need a bunch of tools and a pinch. If you got wire clippers or a set of scissors, you're not too worried about, um, you know, keeping immaculate, then you can pretty much do this whole process with just that. Now, one of the things that people tend to ask, and this is something I covered in my video uh, when I was doing a string video, a how-to, uh, it's about the bridge, mm -hmm. right? Now, it's a floating piece. Now, is there anything, so like some people have pickups, you know, and they really enjoy them and they just, now is, if the bridge gets loose, right if you don't have a pickup in there it's easy you can just put it right back just make sure it's on correctly and whatnot but is there anything we should be concerned about if we have a pickup in there yeah so you know i guess the way that i put them in um or the way that i install pickups is is trying to kind of think ahead that that can happen because yeah like if it's you know yeah like that can just slide right out right so, and if you got a pickup in there um it kind of depends on what the type is. There are like something like the the Eller bags, 5.0, the MySci, any of you that have like a mesh kind of a woven element that threads uh -huh. through. So like, a, so with these, you can see like there's usually two holes. You can drill it. I drilled two holes 
Uh -huh. A lot of those installation manuals have one hole on there. Yeah. So some guys only do that. They'll drill one out, then just lay the pickup down. Yeah. That's when I find it can be a little more uh, problematic because then if that thing flips up or uh, in the course of doing it, like you can almost pull it down into the body more. So the alignment of it changes. Uh -huh. um, the main thing is just like, if you're just mindful or you like, you can, if you put a finger on the saddle, like before you take the strings off or cut them just to kind of keep it in the same place while you're doing this, then it, you don't have to worry about it drifting or anything. And then you can just put a piece of like, you know, blue, like painter's tape over it to hold it in place while you're, you're working on the strings. But if it does come loose, um, really it's just like, look at the way that the pickup is in there and try to make sure that it, um, if it does shift, you can at least realign it to where it needs to go. Most of the time, the holes that are drilled in there are gonna prevent it from sliding a lot in any direction. Um, for them, and usually it's not gonna be anything that comes loose. Like all the, the wiring and that's harnessed inside the body is usually keeps it sucked down close to the, the slot here. Mm. But um, so yeah, I mean, usually you don't need to worry about it. The one thing that does come up if the saddle falls out is people will forget which way is which. So like if it's which was the treble side, which was the base side. Or you, like you can if you put a finger on the saddle like before you if the saddle falls out is people will forget which way is which. So like if it's which was the treble side, which was the base so, side. So um, what you like, can do is finger. take a uh, take like a pencil and just mark it off before you even start. If you even okay. just put a line just for reference, like, okay, I'm going to draw a line in the corner. That way, if it falls out, I know which side was which. It's that easy. Some people will write it on the bottom. Some builders do that at the bottom too. Let's put a little G, a little A. Because if there's a compensated saddle and you flip it around, then your intonation's out of whack when you reverse it. Gotcha. For some, it's not going to make a difference. It might be just, you know, um, symmetrical regardless. And so that wouldn't really matter. But, um, uh, like when we do setup work, sometimes we'll set the treble side a little bit lower. So if the saddle is a little bit thinner on this side than the other, that's that's a good reason to make sure it's in the right spot too. Otherwise, when you flip it back around, your base side is going to be really low. Your treble side is going to be really high. So it's just kind of like take a survey of everything before you start. It's, it's kind of like if you were taking apart like a part of a car, like a bike or something like that. You kind of want to lay things out in a way that you can reassemble them the same way. So like any piece you take, you remove or subtract, either lay it out in a certain way or find a way to identify it or take a photo ahead of time so that you have a visual. Like if you are gonna do any kind of bridge work or saddle work, just snap a quick photo of the bridge. That'll remind you which way the saddle is facing, what everything looked like beforehand, even with the strings. If you just pull the strings off and then you don't know what it looked like and you're trying to replicate how it looked before, at least you got a visual reference for it. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, that that's 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 the biggest thing. Most of the time, the uh, the uh, element of the pickup won't fall out or anything. It's still uh, attached somewhere internally with some wires, so you don't have to worry about that too much. Uh... Um, so when it comes to removing these, you can just literally just slide them out. And if you have, if I'm not as worried about this, like this thing's already kind of taken a, a beating over the years, but if you have a new instrument, you're trying to keep pristine, or if you have like one with a softer top, like cedar, spruce, rosewood, um, it doesn't hurt to just to be extra, extra careful when you're putting strings in. So what I usually do is, um, you know, you could use something as simple as like, a, I wouldn't necessarily put masking tape directly on it, just with certain finishes, even with delicate tape, you can sometimes uh, damage the finish. But um, Stuart McDonald makes a really low tack tape that's supposed to be made for like vintage instruments. So like mm -hmm. I've always put that on and it's always been fine and you use that as a base. But then you can use something like a business card. I usually use um, the metal action card that I have. Um, but yeah, like two or three business cards, a credit card, just on top of something smooth to protect the finish and then lay this on there and that'll protect the finish with any like string snapback. If a string snip uh, slips out of place right. when you're tuning it, it'll have this kind of like catapult, like slingshot effect and it's gonna whip back and you can, you know, crack the finish 
kind of at least ding the top, especially on like the softer woods, just from uh, the force, like it'll break your skin, let alone like, you know, damage the top. So, and even just maneuvering your fingers and everything around here, your fingernails, you can just mar up the top pretty well. So usually you see damage like all around this area right? from people changing strings or from the string ends, like, you know, they're all loose when they're getting them tied on. So like, it's going to scratch up all around here. Mm -hmm. So if you want to protect it, just do that prep work. Yeah. You can, you can even cut out, you could get a piece of construction paper and just cut out a little square from where the paper is just laid on there to protect it. And then, you know, use something a little harder to reinforce it for anything that's like, you know, blunt force or anything. Mm -hmm. And, uh, it'll just keep it looking nice a lot longer. Some guys Ooh. use, uh, you can get like an iPhone or iPad cover, just cut those things out, stick them on there, like the static cling ones. And it'll just at least hold it in place while you're doing the work and you can just take it off right after. But, um, that's just one little thing to keep it extra nice. And if you're like, if you're working in a shop and you're stringing up for customers, like we do, then it's, you got to keep it in pristine condition. So it's just, mm -hmm. I could just get extra careful about that. But all right. So moving into the actual restring. So I always go uh, bridge first. And uh, one trick, if you ever have trouble like pushing it through, like getting the right angle, usually you can bend the strings a little bit, just get like a little bit of a hook going. So that way when you get it through the initial hole, you can kind of just uh, twist it a bit to get it to come out. And then it's just, it's coming right back up at you rather than just shooting down and scraping along the soundboard. Now, what kind of string is that? So this is uh, the gold alloy smooth wound. It uh -huh. is, um, so it's not real gold. It's just, uh, you know, that alloy just means it's a mix of um, a few different metals, but it has like this bronze kind of golden color to it. It yeah. uh, starts off as like a regular round wound uh, metal string. Uh -huh. And then they, they polish it down. So you get all those little ridges and bumps that are normally, if you think of like round wire wrapped around something, you're going to have all these little uh, little humps and like valleys in between. Right. So when you run your fingers over it, you usually hear it like the, the you know, the lines on your finger will go over uh -huh. it and you hear that kind of squeaky, scratchy kind of sound to it. This, you know, it eliminates that essentially. They just polish it down until those ridges are gone. And sweet. It's got a nice uh, smooth sound to it and it drops the diameter down a little bit too. So you get the same sound as a bigger string, but, uh, you know, it keeps the, the mass and the uh, diameter down a little bit. So that would be what we call a low G string. Right. Yeah. yeah. So it, like, it, yeah, pretty much anytime you see a metal string in this position, it's, it's going to be a low G mm. or on a baritone low D like, um, definitely don't try to tune it up to a high G. Right. It's, it's not going to get close. It's going to break before you get there, but it's also, uh, it's just, you know, the less, the less, uh, stress you put on your, your bridge, the better, and it's going to be scary yeah. when it breaks. So yeah, just, uh, <laughs> it's going to be on the set of caution. Well. Yeah. <laughs> also, if you're, yeah, if you're looking at string packages, linear, if it says linear sets, then that means it's going to be a low G. If it's a re-entrant, then that means it's a, a high G, but yeah, pretty much anytime you see a metal one. The exception being like there'll be a metal string uh, for the C string sometimes. Right. Like certain companies still do that. Um, so you know, oh, it doesn't always have to be cool. the G. Uh, yeah. It's more of like a, it seems like it's more of a Hawaii thing too. Yeah. Like the yeah. low sets. And yes. Like Koolau did it, but it's a, uh, the Dario has a black nylon set like that now too, but it's, it all just feels like a, yeah, just like that old school Hawaiian yeah. setup. Yeah, pretty much. Oh, okay. Let's let's go over this wrapping. Sorry. Yeah. I've been no, it's okay. I, 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 I went down on <laughs> autopilot. Autopilot, right? <laughs> okay. So um, so once you got it through the bridge, I think just uh, it's gonna loop, lay back over itself, and then you just spin it around once. So essentially just circling once and then putting it through that loop. So through the bottom. Gotcha. Over the top, through the loop. And depending on how thick the string is, um, I might go through twice, but uh -huh. maybe three times. It partially will depend on how thick 
the this piece is you're tying it to. If it's really mm -hmm. narrow, you don't need to loop it as many times. Um, but if the string is extra thin, like for, so for the A string, I'm going to go twice for this string. I'm probably only just going to go once. Um, so the way I do it is once you got your tail end here, I'm basically going to pin my thumbnail up against the, see if I can get an angle, up against the corner of the bridge, not pushing into the soundboard, but just anchoring it against the, the corner of the bridge and then pull from this side and it'll close that close that loop in there or you can tug from both sides it's just um it's just getting the slack out of the knot but ultimately you want to make sure that the the little tail on this end is following the back side if you pull it too much you wind up you can wind up with it on top yeah and that's not just, good yeah it's not good so if that happens don't worry about it just push some slack back through this side mm -hmm. and then uh just start over again and then just you know, pull from this side until you got that anchor and then eat up the, eat up the slack there. Right. And one thing I found that helps me when, especially when, you know, it comes to that, where it possibly lays on the top of the bridge is, you know, if I wind it twice, then it mm -hmm. kind of adds that extra length over the span of that bridge. Yeah. Exactly. So, yeah. So like for a, for a wider one, um, like this is, this is right in the middle. So you can, you can literally do two at least thinner mm -hmm. ones like uh looks like the pono ones are thin enough that you can just go once that's so, right yeah, after once you can go twice and then that gives it that extra distance where it kind of forces that that back end back a little yeah, bit yeah that and then you don't yeah so yeah most most of the time just just do two if, yeah. it, if it bunches up and you got this like rainbow hump kind of happening right here uh -huh. then that usually means you could have got away with one but it's the main thing is that it's anchored and then uh there's not like a bunch of slack in it. And then just uh -huh. out of habit, I kind of take my nail and I'll push this loop down. So it kind of sucks in tight against the, the corner there rather than it drifting up. Uh -huh. So so it's nice and snug, yeah? Yeah, yeah. So, and then, yeah, and then it's going to it's gonna stay in place once you got all the tension on it. Like you can, you can pull on this. It's not going to go anywhere. Uh-huh. And then moving up to the... To the headstock so now here's a good question especially when we're stringing and we're trying to do this how much slack do we need or how can we determine how much uh, slack to keep before we start winding the string so in my video i did like maybe either a fist uh from the fret you know up or a three finger or two finger what do you use to kind of help determine how much slack you should uh keep the first thing i look at is um how how much distance there is um so you can get it up close so like how much distance you have from where the hole is on the tuner post to where it's going to wind down because if you leave too much slack it's going to all bunch up at the bottom and you're going to like stack in the string on top of itself mm -hmm. um and too too little if you have no slack and you know it depends on the instrument but say like say i left no slack with this yeah you see how the the string angle as it leaves the nut is like almost parallel with where it goes in at yes that's when you can wind up with the string um just like oscillating side by side in the nut oh. and uh you can get like just that buzzing when you play open strings or like a weird right tone out of it so you want the yeah. angle to go to drop down a bit so that it anchors and that way you know the very tip of the the nut is going to be the friction point otherwise like you know up like there it could just be moving side to side in the in the slot so i try to look at like a string like this the metal one it's not going to nearly need to wrap around as many times as a it's not going to have as much stretch in it as a metal as a as a plain string i see but it's going to be thicker too so it's like it's gonna it's gonna add some stacks on there pretty quick but also you're not going to wind up like just winding and winding indefinitely like you can with some nylon strings like right. aquila strings are one of the more stretchy ones so huh. those are the ones that tend to be like even if you take all the slack out of it there's times i string it up tune it tune it tune it they're all kind of stacking on top of each other because it's a if it's like a shallow uh tuner post mm -hmm. and then i'll unwind it pull the rest of the slack through and do it again just to you know eat up all the area that's stretched through because you don't want it to be 
you know, too bunched up. Some tuners will just keep sucking the string down uh -huh. past the bushing and then can actually end up cutting into it. Oh. If it, if it keeps winding down lower and lower, it kind of depends on the tuner. Like some just have a bigger opening. Yeah. Um, right there. So if you notice that it's, it can happen with the Goto, the planetaries. Like I love those yeah. tuners, but um, that it, it can happen on those occasionally. Like if you have a really thin string and a lot of slack and it's just winding down and down and you notice that the string keeps breaking, mm -hmm. it's usually that it's winding down and getting sucked down past the, the ah. pushing there. And then that's slicing the string after it gets to a certain tension or it just creates a friction point. So once the string gets to a certain tension, then it just, it pops like it's all under stress. Right. So, and you know what? And now that you mention it, and I just realized just now that, yeah, like, for example, on the Kualoa, it's long. You have a pretty good amount of time, I mean, uh, post to go down, whereas mm -hmm. some are very short. So the likelihood of you getting it past the bushing and at clipping is actually much higher, right? Yeah. You know? Yeah, it totally depends because some are just like barely creeping up past the, past the, uh, the face plate, and then some uh -huh. just have extra long tuners. And uh, it depends on the angle of the headstock too. The headstock yeah. angles kick back quite a ways. That's gonna, uh -huh. even if you have long tuners, it's gonna drop it back. But if it's a little more parallel, then you don't, you know, you gotta make sure you have enough slack to wind it down. So like, I don't, there's still times where I don't get it perfect and I gotta unwind it and then mess around with how much slack I have to get it dialed in. Oh. Um, but it's generally like, that's, that's what I'm thinking about is generally I'm looking at like what string it is that I'm putting on uh, where it kind of lines up on its own, how much space there is, mm -hmm. like where I want the string to kind of end up, um, where I want it to end up on the tuner once I'm done wrapping it. So and if then, it's uh, straight angle, just like that, if there is no angle, that's not what you want. You want to make sure you create an angle, right? So right. as as no matter how uh, high or how short the post is, you want to get it as close to the bottom, but not as low as the bushing area. Right. Like ideally yeah. the way the, it's not always the case, but ideally like when you're cutting nut slots, you want, uh, you want the slot to be the, the angle of the slot to go about the same angle as the, uh, same angle that the headstock kicks back. Uh. So like if I was cutting these nut slots, I would want them to be at this angle. If it's, if it's cut too flat, you're, you're kind of, ha you're having the same problem. You're creating the same problem for the string. Mm. is that it's too level so like the nut slots need to be angled correctly in the first place and then as you wind the strings it should follow that same angle sloping down uh at at least the same like um grade that the headstock is pointing back and it's not like there's a lot of wiggle room there the main mm -hmm. thing is that it's not sitting too high like it you can wind it all the way down to the base and it'll be fine if it's not one of those tuners that has that extra gap where it's going to suck it in it's okay if the string does stack on top of itself. Like uh -huh. BB King used to leave an enormous amount of slack and it would just wrap and wrap and wrap around those tuners. And it's, you know, that worked out fine for him. So it's more of like aesthetically, it's just kind of like an OCD, like a nice thing to have it nice and clean. But it's also, you don't, if you don't need more string there, there's less to stretch out. So, that, you know, usually they settle in quicker if there's less slack, but then, mm -hmm. you know, you need to leave enough slack that, especially before you cut it. Yeah. Or if you know if you make not, a mistake, it doesn't hurt to have a little bit left over. So I usually don't yeah. cut the strings until I'm yeah, right. totally done, put them all on. Or the higher you start tuning them, it can actually slip out if you don't have enough slack. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. It, yeah. And so depending on how you tie them off to, there's ways to get around it. Um, it's usually with the thinnest strings and it ends up usually being fluorocarbon, like the A yes. string on fluorocarbons because it's so thin. Yes. And it's dense. It's like pulling a slippery rope through a knot. Yeah. Like once you get enough tension on it and there's enough friction there, it's fine. But if you just kind of do a limp, mm -hmm. you know, wrap through the, the knob, then those are easy to pull out when you won't notice it until you get to a certain tension. And then the thing slips all of a sudden. Right. So um, there is a trick for that, though. So I, I, I can go over that, too. Cool. But um, so, yeah. So for this, um, ways you go about it is just think of the string like you always start off in the middle okay and then it's going to loop outwards so the g and c strings will go down the middle and then loop this way the e and a strings will get on the middle and then loop this way so i set all of my tuner posts so that the holes are facing up just so that it's ready when it comes time to 
put the strings in. So then you can guide it through the nut slot. And I usually just pinch it with my thumb there so that it's not you know, flopping around. And if you want to make it easier, if you kind of want to gauge your slack, you can pull some from this side. And then this is going to be your slack here. Mm. And then you can just work with a tight string up here to get it attached. Your thumb will be the anchor point. So like all this is tight. You don't have to worry about it all flopping around. And then you can just work with your left hand to get it uh, positioned and anchored on there. So coming down from the center through the top. Pull that through. And then I usually go again if it's... Uh, you know, if it's applicable, if it's like, again, like if you have a really short tuner and not a lot of space there for the, the windings, you can just go once. Um, and some thicker strings aren't going to be able to fit through the hole twice. Mm -hmm. So in those cases, um, let's see, I'll do a single one for this since it's, this is usually going to be the one that people have issues with, and then I can do a double on the others. Awesome. But um, so go through once, go back in the opposite direction, and then just slip the string under itself as it leaves the nut. And then you're just gonna pull that through. The thing is uh, to make sure this loop stays here. So like, sometimes I'll just plant my finger on top of the tuner. That way it can't possibly come up and out of the way. Uh huh. And then just, you know, work its way through. And then as it seals up, it's gonna curve back around and then just pull straight up. Oh. So just do it one more time. So I go through the first time around, up and down, reverse it, slip it under itself, pull that through. And then this is the kind of like the, the lockout. So when you pull it up like that, what it does is it ends up pulling the string so that it's looped around itself rather than oh. curving around the, the metal, um, the opening of the hole in the post. So it, it adds less, it's more of like, um, it's kind of like adding a cushion yeah. um, for the string. So it's like wraps the, the point that's gonna have the most friction or would have the most friction against the hole there. Cause some might be a little, I mean, usually it's, it's chamfered or beveled so that it's not gonna cut the string, but some are just, a little sharper than others, or it's just like a 90 degree angle there. So if the strings are more delicate, then uh, that's like a good spot for it to just add a kink or a breaking point. Cool. So by looping it up like that, it not only like locks in the string a little bit better, but also it uh, creates like a little bit of a buffer there. So then it doesn't, um, you know, have like a sharp edge to it. So then once you got that on, that's anchored. It's just keeping tension on like wherever you just tied it on at. And that'll uh, make sure like it doesn't like come loose on you. But so after locking it up, I just I still keep my thumb on that first fret, uh -huh. and then just start tuning. And then um, just make sure like if this is in the way, if if you have like a lot of extra slack, you can just cut it. Um, you don't have to cut it close, but just there's so much to this. I'll just get it a little close just to get it out of the way, but still leave some slack in case I mess something up. Mm -hmm. And then just as it winds, just making sure that it's tracking down. Ah. So we still have all that slack that we gave ourselves in the beginning. Right. So as you uh, as you wind it down, it should wind up in the the right spot by the time we're done. The, the tricky part is like, and you don't really know it until you've done it a bunch of times, is how much stretch is actually going to come out of the string. Like <laughs> yeah. by the time, like sometimes I just, I, you know, will over underestimate it and you either wind up with a little bit more or less. So yeah, that's why it helps to keep that little bit of slack there just in case. But that's um, right. I mean, ultimately, like if it's not a, I think this is going to, yeah. So like, even though like you could go a little bit lower on that, that angle would still still work. The way to find out to know for sure is just when you get it to pitch. Mm -hmm. If you just if you just dig in and pluck it, if it's not buzzing, then 
usually that means the you know the angle of the nut slot and everything is good and it's not going to be an issue but if you hear like that uh obvious kind of like buzzing or a weird overtone and it's level with the nut slot that's usually what the problem is ah uh, so angles are very important everybody yeah yeah same yeah same thing with the saddle like people will want to take the saddle down i've seen it to where it's almost like non-existent <laughs> there's a point mean. where yeah well it's like so the trouble is like you either wind up to a, a point where um either the bridge starts to get in the way like so even like the way i have this one set up i'd either have to you know take the strings off and like sand and kind of carve out the corner of this uh the backing for the saddle if i want to lower it more because it's going to hit that edge and then the pressure isn't on the saddle um and then for the, like the the bridges that allow you to take down the saddle like quite a bit you can get to the point where the string is just just barely like resting on top of it and you get so much lateral movement that you're not really getting pressure down on the saddle like into the into the bridge quite as much the biggest issue is like when you have a pickup and it's like that because you might not have enough direct pressure down on the saddle to push uh -huh. and activate the crystals in the in the bridge so if the strings are just laying on top you don't have that downward pressure so you might have like a couple strings that just the pickup's not getting anything so you need a lot enough you know enough downward pressure on it to uh to keep the strings from drifting too much but also to you know to keep the pickup working right if you do have a pickup system otherwise you know if you're a really gentle player i've seen people just it's almost it's barely on there but they play so light that it's not really an issue but you know it's going to be an issue when you want to start to dig in a little bit ah uh. Um, okay, so for there, I'll, um, here, I'll just do the other one real quick, and then we can, um, once we get to the, the thinner string, I will uh, show you the way to um, kind of do the lockout with using two, two loops around the tuner post, and then um, it's the same same principle though. Like usually, uh, I know some people just stick it through the hole once and then um, just start kind of turning it, and that's usually when it starts to to slip out on you. But um, if you use that locking method, like I did with the the wound string, usually that'll keep it in place. But um, going through the the tuner post hole twice will um usually be a big help for that. All right. Because yeah, the A string is the one that gives everybody the hardest everybody the time. most trouble in all situations. The C string is the buzzy one. The A string is the one that, that slips and breaks and is too twangy or too hard or it's the it's the delicate one it's yeah the, it's the baby string <laughs> <laughs> it's sensitive you got to be gentle with it yeah um okay so just to get it out of the way i'm going to just trim these a little bit cool that's the other thing so i know i see a lot of people they'll bring in instruments and they just leave the string in ends there yeah if you do and you hear kind of like buzzing or rattling. It's just uh -huh. usually these things vibrating mm -hmm. off the soundboard. Somebody took a two and a half hour bus ride down from town one day to bring it in, thinking they needed like a a brace reglued or something, and then just it strummed just it once and trimmed the string ends and handed it back to him. It's like oh, that, was, <laughs> that was it. I was like, how much does it cost? It's like, well, it only took ten seconds, so you can, it's it's free. But next time you put strings on, just. <laughs> And uh, that's a good thing, though. For, so people should know, like, that area where the bridge is connected, that's where the vibration happens. You know, that's where <laughs> everything goes, broom, you know. Yeah. So if, if anything uh, is left on there, it's going to cause excess noise, yeah? Yeah, it's like if you, um, if you had, like a, like, a snare drum or something, and you laid something on top of it, and you go and you flick it, like, it's all the whole thing is vibrating this is basically uh -huh. like the drum head of the instrument so yes this is doing the bulk of the the vibrating so anything touching it 
it can potentially dampen it if it's something touching it lightly, including like when you do a pickup installation, if there's wires or anything, even if it's just lightly brushed up against it, mm -hmm. that's what you can hear, you know, rattling or a lot of times it mimics the sound of like a loose brace or something like that. So like it can be a very deceiving or kind of like scary sound sometimes. But the first yeah. thing to check is to make sure nothing is you know, touching something it shouldn't. Same thing like up at the headstock. Um, I can go over that real quick too, actually, because that's since we got it out. Um, so I have a more delicate tool than this at the shop, but um, so like the, a lot of tuners will have like a hex, hex nut style um, bushing there o over time or sometimes, I mean, even straight from the, the factory, they may be a little loose. But if you hear like uh, rattling or um, just, it can even sound like buzzing. Some people, if it's not super loose, you can almost sound like a fret buzz when you're playing that string. But um, when you do hear some kind of like odd buzzing or rattling, the way I start diagnosing it is just like trying to grab these and mute them as you're playing uh... and see if you can isolate it to, to one of them. Sometimes it'll be the knobs because um, some of them will have a, a screw that you can tighten if like just the, the knob itself is loose. Um, you know, there could be hardware in the back. So like just tightening things down if you hear an odd kind of like mechanic or buzzy rattle, but like uh, with these, it doesn't hurt when you uh, go to change strings just to make sure you don't have to like, don't crank on anything. You don't have to use like really any, any force, but just, you know, make sure that it's, it's snug and, uh, you know, ideally you'd use something like a nut driver or I got another one at work. Like this is all just coated in uh, like some tape and padding so that you don't scratch anything up when you're doing it. But um, yeah, that's the other thing. Just whenever you're changing strings, it's a good opportunity to like clean things up and check stuff out to make sure that, uh, you know, everything is just looking good. So when you got the strings on there, you don't have to worry about it and you're not gonna be trying to work around strings if yeah. there is an issue. Okay, so now I'm moving on to the A string. So same thing, we're gonna put it through. We're gonna do this one three times just because it's a thinner one and this would be the one to, to slip out if it did. So same thing though, cross it over and then you're just looping it through that hole there once, twice, and you could even go three times if you want. And uh, when you do that, it just creates enough length that it, it'll it just suck in there. So when you have enough length like that, you almost don't need to push your finger in there. It's just gonna automatically suck the end of it in when you're pulling from this side. And then uh, once you got enough tension on there, we're back up. We're gonna put it through the slot, gonna plant our thumb there and then gauge about how much slack we're going to need so it's a thin string and it's the tuners the closest to the slot so i usually give a little bit extra for these so i'm just gonna estimate it's about this much slack and then uh just to get these out of the way Okay, so starting from the middle, go through the top. So I'm trying to like look around my camera and do it at the same time. <laughs> go one more time again. Oh yeah. And then back and around the opposite direction. So and now that it's already like it's it's anchored in there, you can kind of if you need to maneuver it, you can, you know, take your thumb off of the the fretboard and you basically just want to make sure it's going around and under. So you can, you know, you can get a little creative with how you get it there, but the main thing is that uh it slips under there. You can pull this tight again and then do that trick where we just flip and lock it up. And then if you need to, you can always like take a look at uh, how the string is winding 
as you're tightening it, just to make sure that it's winding down rather than uh, so I get the right angle there. Rather than like stacking on itself or like creeping up in the opposite direction, because I'll see a lot of people like half the strings are winding down the post and a couple are winding up, like they're yeah. gonna kind of come up off the top. So it's just a matter of like, you know, guiding with your finger. You can always just, you know, push it down yeah. a little bit to, to guide it's it not, as you do it. Right there, what you're doing right now is is the way I fix that problem because I would always have that issue. You know, it would go mm -hmm. up and down. So I would put my finger above the nut and hold it down exactly the way you're doing it now. Yeah, yeah, because it just and it just guides it. So like, yeah, if yeah. this is, if you look close, like this is the. I never really think about it. This is what's going on in my fist when I'm holding yeah. it. So I got the, the string guide of my middle finger pushed up against right. my hand, and then I'm holding the neck with these two. Mm -hmm. The thumb's anchoring it there, so you don't have all the extra slack creeping up, and then index right. finger is pushing down on this, which is, you know, it, it's. I don't think I don't think about it when I'm doing it. That's just kind of what it works, but it's a, uh, you don't have to coordinate all those parts, but the main thing is you got something to kind of guide it down here. Mm -hmm. If you've ever seen like a Fender uh, guitar, it has like those string trees that guides the string under it. It's, it's yes. basically what you're doing with your index finger. That's right. And then once you get most of the slack out, you can just, you know, drop it in the slot and then just, it'll tighten on its own. And then, you know, at that point, you're pretty much good to go. You'll notice if, um, like, yeah, again, and like you can tune it up to pitch before, um, before cutting the the rest of the slack there, just in case you know it does start to pull out or anything. But if you did that double loop and that backwards kind of lock off method, then it really shouldn't uh, shouldn't creep out on you. Um, and then we can also go over, uh, doing like the, the knots for pin bridges or string through bridges. And then there's a, a trick you can use, especially with the A strings. It's so thin. If it's pulling out whenever you put it in a, a pin bridge or a string through, especially Yeah. Is that one. Let's talk about the different types of bridges. Go ahead. Show us. Okay, sure. So like the type bridge is the one we just did. A pin bridge would be, um, would look like that. So you're basically feeding the string with the knotted end, just for the sake of visual. So like you're feeding like a, you got to tie your own knot usually, but you're you're feeding it through, and then it's gonna. There's usually a little bit of a like a slot that guides it down. And then when you put the, the pin in there, it's gonna anchor the string, like kind of lock it into the slot. And then it blocks this knot from coming back through. So it's like it, the tension of all of it together kind of keeps everything locked in place, but nothing is like permanently secured. Um, so some of those, they actually have like a, a ball, right? Mm -hmm. um, so, some of those, even with the regular uh, pin bridge or versus the other one that just has a regular ball, um, they basically act the same way, right? They're basically just anchors to hold it in, yeah? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so like, you'll, like um, you know, steel string guitars, they, they have ball ends on them for the same reason because usually mm -hmm. it's a, like a pin bridge is going to be what's on the most acoustic guitars. Um, and then like, you know, electrics, Usually, you're, uh, a lot of times you're feeding them through the back, and they just have a space to kind of lock in that that ball end. But on a like a classical, because um, you're also using, you know, thicker, more flexible strings. Mm -hmm. um, most of them don't come with that pre-attached because I mean a lot of classicals are tie bridges. So when it comes to one of these, you know, something like a like a pin bridge, which is technically going to be used for both. Um, you're either tying a knot yourself, which is what you know most people do, um, and that this takes the place of a ball end. Um, 
what some people do is just tie a basic knot and you can get like a some guys use like a, a jewelry bead or something like that so oh. you can tie a knot and then you just thread that through and then that just works as like a stopper the same way um what i noticed because i initially got these uh to include with it if just getting the right uh material like if you get a like these are wooden beads if you get some that are too brittle or um have like a lot of lines in them and a thin string it can actually like slice through it or like some of the cheaper plastic ones um the thinner strings will kind of slice through them a little bit so not it's not always the case it's but some people will uh like tie the tie the string around the bead like this uh -huh. that's when usually then it's kind of works like a like cheese wire and it might actually like cut through or bust the whatever the bead you're using um uh. so like you know metal is going to last longer the tricky yeah. thing about metal is that depending on what you took it from or how it was molded you could have like a sharp edge mm -hmm. so like this is a this is a ball end that just comes off of a an acoustic uh, uh -huh. like acoustic guitar string it has a little it has a little groove in it see if it shows up in the right right so, so like a yo-yo yeah yeah exactly like a yo-yo so the string like guides around that little groove in there so just for a illustration stake let's say this thing is the this is the ball in if you some people will just use it like the same way like that that uh that bead was and just slip the string through the the base of the ball in and just stick it through and then tie it out on the other end and use it as a stopper oh for thinner strings I've found because then you, with that is fine for bigger ones, but you don't really. It's not even usually an issue for the bigger ones. It's usually like the like a high G or the A string that's so thin, and you either tie like two or three knots on top yeah. of each other to get it thick enough so it doesn't pull through. And if you just thread thread it through the ball, and it's going to be the same thing. You still need to tie several knots so it doesn't pull through that hole, and then pull through the hole in the bridge anyway. I but that group off of my guitar strings. <laughs> yeah. No, yeah, it's it, it helps a lot. Yeah. So the um, what I realized for the, I only started doing this in the last um, few years, but for the A string, you just wrap it around like how, like how the acoustic strings already come. Like they use a, a thinner piece of wire and it loops around and then they twist it. For the nylon, you're gonna have to. Um, I'm just gonna use a white string so it's give Aquila a little bit of a plug just because it's going to be more visible mm -hmm. but um so basically you were just creating uh I use like a, a figure eight knot start with a piece of string give it like a couple inches go over cross it over itself underneath and then you're just gonna twist and then thread it through the hole and then you should wind up with a with a shape ah. like this. And then what you're gonna do is you're gonna take the uh, that first little loop there. Yeah. And then you're just gonna work like a like a noose around that um the groove in the ball in. So like you, it's the part that takes a little bit of a little bit of patience. Like so it usually helps like to put the ball in down on something flat, and then you just uh basically like a cinch it in around it. So then once you got it on there, you know, it helps to have some some pliers on one end to just pull it tight. But um, so once you do that, oh, it basically wow. wraps it around the same way, same principle as the tie bridge, where it's wrapped around there. So the tension of the string is holding it in place. But then you have this little, let's see, you have this little loop on the end that is taking the brunt of the tension. Yeah. So you, so it's not cutting against the corner of a metal bead or against the corner of the wood or anything it's just pulling on itself so it's a lot less likely that you're going to get the string to snap just from the the tension that's at the top of a knot um and with a thinner fluorocarbon string you can do that same uh that same knot you can do it twice so just to make it a little bit easier to see so like imagine this is the this is the ball in and just imagine this is a giant aquila string 
but um <laughs> so like you're gonna put over once flip that over pull it through and then you have this uh ah. kind of nice mark and then you're gonna fit it around the ball in and then just cinch it tight and then this is what basically it looks like so you have a all of the the pulling tension is around this loop part so it's not cutting any corners it's not a it's just pulling it on itself and if it's a really thin string you can add that extra loop right there if it if it needs it um if it's like a really thin especially like fluorocarbon string you can go twice oh. just to give a little bit of extra um friction in there so then once you got this in there this is the anchor that's you know gonna pull against the bridge pin or the base plate if it's a string through bridge rather than it just being like a knot that is slowly gonna get like sucked up into the hole or usually like the string is gonna break at a certain point because it's all just tied in amongst itself and if you just got a like a square knot on a string all that tension is going to be right at the tip of that uh the tip of that string so once you get it up to pitch and it's been on there enough like that's usually where it's going to break or it at least creates a fragile point where it can break that is genius dude that is exactly what i need right on yeah so like i bought um i mean i need to start putting them out there so people whenever people need them i i just give them with the sets but um like i got these these are all like because you can oh. salvage them off of like most of the ones you salvage from a set will be fine. Uh -huh. um, some of the ones I used to like cobble together that I would just come across like the if it's like a really cheap like a like nickel or just the when they put the metal into the molds if it's really uh -huh. sloppy you can wind up with sharp edges. Yeah. So like those, you know, you're probably gonna wind up with more problems than not. But like I got these from another dealer on Etsy. They're all just like brand new. Uh, savage ball ends but if you play guitar we, before you throw away your strings just trim that long. thing off yeah and un unwrap the steel part and just hold on to them and they work great for that but uh yeah i found that works a lot better than you know regular string beads and uh it's a bit easier on the string so then once you have once you have it tied off like that you're not going to see all this extra slack inside the body. You still don't want a ton of it. Like some people literally leave like a lot and that's something that can touch the inside of the body and uh. create buzzing and everything. So, you know, something like that isn't too bad. I usually just say like a half an inch once you've already pulled it tight and you know that like all the tension's taken out of it, um, that should be enough. And then you can feed that through the, you know, through the pin bridge and then put your pin in. Uh huh. If you're doing this with a with a string through bridge, you're going to need to put it through the hole first, fish it out, and then you're going to have to have it come up through the the sound hole, and then mm -hmm. do, do it all through there. So just make I sure think that's what's going to have to be done with mine when that's being made right now. <clears throat> if yeah. I'm taken, yeah, yeah. So it's that's the biggest thing. Like you can go through all this, you tie it off, you get it all perfect, and then you realize you. Just, you didn't put it through the bridge first, which I, I've done. Because sometimes I'll go on autopilot. I tie off the ends because I know I'm putting it in the pin bridge. So I just do them real quick, get them prepped. And then uh, I've done that for string throughs. And then you end up chopping off the, nut, the, yeah. the knots you made and having to do it again. So, um, <laughs> And the trick for that, too, because the frustrating thing will be you got it all done. You finally got your knots all around the ball end and everything. And then this gets snagged or something. And you just you pull it through. And it goes through the the body and then you're left with the same thing all over again yeah so yeah. just uh just take it's 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 easy just take a piece of tape <laughs> when if you you feed it through and you know you got enough slack just uh just just tape the other end of it to the bridge or something just <laughs> something to tack it so it doesn't pull through on you and you can feel free to like use two hands to to work on it and then you're not gonna accidentally jerk it through or something right right um oh and then the other one was the uh the three hole uh the three hole setup right oh yeah okay so for that okay so you know forgive this uh just for simplicity's sake and to make it a little easier to see on the the camera so if you got three holes imagine this is like the 
coming out this side of the the bridge. Sure. Um, so the way a lot of guys do it, it's um, it's gonna it's gonna loop, and then it, it kind of anchors itself again. So it's it's almost like um, the same principle as a just a regular tie bridge, but it's just gonna be. I, I've seen them do it a few different ways. Like you can go um, go in through the bottom, go through the second from the right come back through the other side and then loop it through and then they'll kind of chain that chain that through to the other ones so that they all kind of uh anchor and tie themselves in you wouldn't need um, a knot for that usually so what, what some guys do is they'll leave enough slack so you do all four and then you're constantly threading the tail end through the next one just like you do here but more at the end and you can either for the last string, you can either tie a knot. Um, some guys just, if you, I mean, if you got enough slack, you can hold it up. If you just singe it with a lighter, it creates like a little ball on the end of it. It just kind of melts the plain string. Um, it's usually, again, it's usually going to be the A string. If you've just, it just, it's usually that I see with this type of bridge, they do it where they chain like all four of the strings together. Uh -huh. um, you could do them individually. So then, yeah, you might, you know, you probably would want to tie a knot on the end of it just so it doesn't, uh, you know, just so it doesn't slip through once it starts to pull. Right. But um, if you if you just leave a bunch of extra slack and you want to, you know, it's mainly for aesthetics too. But like you know, chain them all across and you do this three more times. Usually the tension of those other three strings or two strings or like the the one after it is going to hold that uh, slack in so it's not like you need to put a knot on every single one of them so sometimes i'll string them all up like that and then just put a knot on the a string the rest of them are uh, going to be anchored in by the slipping under the other ones after it i but, see. um it's a. Uh, and what's the purpose for making it like that is there a specific reason why they do that that style you know i, I think it, it might i've never really uh questioned a, like a builder about it it seems to be like the guys that are more into like a classical just like a traditional way of building like i believe um i believe luis uh does it with the uh, like lfdms because he's like um he just has like that like uh, old kind of uh you know they're not all like gypsy jazz style uh mm -hmm. builds or anything but um i'm sure i'm sure someone has an argument for the, the physics of it as to something that it does to me i don't know exactly how it differs from a regular tie bridge i look at it as more of like an aesthetic thing or for some people like they make like they even make um these little like bridge beads that they're called for classical guitars and it's a series of holes and they give you this uh -huh. diagram and you just loop the string through a bunch of holes but you don't actually have to tie a knot it just it works itself around enough times that the tension holds it in and some for some people that is somehow easier for them to navigate than just looping around the bridge uh, so i don't know if it's partially uh you know i mean to me i'd say it's mostly like a, an aesthetic thing it looks it looks kind of cool and a little uh complicated though like when you're looking at it visually so i can see why no one really wants to yeah to touch it the first time i saw it i just kind of like stared at it and <laughs> Push, push the strings through that's usually like if you got it right from the builder too and you know it's not just some random person who just yeah. kind of hodgepodge it together and just right you know i've seen some people just straight up tie a knot they're like they gave up and they just like the strings attached it's fine <laughs> but uh if it looks like it was done intentionally you can usually just like loosen the strings up just kind of push them through from the other direction without undoing the knots and you can kind of just like you know reverse engineer it the same way they put it on because i've seen it I've seen it done a couple of different ways. The same way, like with attaching at the tuners, I've seen that done four or five different ways. Um, uh, I, I keep doing it the way that's how I learned how to do it. And it was mainly um, just that, that like locking method um, was explained to me to help keep the strings from slipping. But then I just, I realized over enough time, the secondary benefit of it was having that soft loop edge of the string and be the friction point rather than, you know, the edge of, the metal or something because if it's yeah. you know some cheaper instruments or like older tuners especially if they got some corrosion on it it could be like a rough spot and eventually you're just kind of eroding and sawing away at the the string but uh 
that's uh, yeah that, that's that's basically it and then those the same thing with those knots um it's the same principle for like a a slotted bridge where you would just you know tie a knot and then uh slip it through the if you have like it like it would be like on an old uh kamaka or like a martin maybe uh -huh. so if you you just use the same same knot that you would um you can do like a figure eight knot uh, -huh. uh you might need to just do a regular uh, square knot if it's a really thick string and it can't fit in the hole then you just tie like just a basic like just uh -huh. square knot like that and then uh the trick is to trim enough of it away that it's not going to get in the way but not um not trim it so much. short that once you pull it that it's going to slip Come through on. the knot uh... so and then um like what i usually do is feed it in feed it in this way with the the pointed end going into the hole and then um you know like flipping it up and around and then guiding the top through the slot it's not too many people use that bridge style anymore it's usually like um like vintage instruments or anything but it's uh some do like some of the fender instruments will have it mm -hmm. but um it's the same principle as like you know doing the the pin bridges or a string through like do the same knots you're just uh laying it in that hole and then guiding the string through the slot. And then once it has tension on it, you know, then it's gonna, it'll stay in place. So it's, um, you know, there's a, we got the video at the ukulele site where we covered all the bridges where um, there's like a little bit of a, a close up of that one. I'm trying to remember if it was, key, I think it was Kiwai that they have some models that use it, but um, yeah, it's the same, same knots and everything you're using for any of these other ones, the pin bridges or anything. And it's just uh, being extra careful for the top with those because the hole is right next to the the corner of the bridge. So when it's laying down and you're trying to trying to guide the guide this into the the hole there, it's mm -hmm. easy to just like jam it and kind of mar up the the finish. So having something something protective that you can lay behind it, whether it's a you know a couple layers of tape, a business card, something so that you're just gonna protect the top it goes through okay. the slot you can pull it up and over and then you know usually you're fine but um that's that pretty much covers like a anything that you're gonna come across i don't know of any other bogeys as of yet but it's usually gonna be tie and pin bridges that's awesome dude Thank you very much, sir. That was super informative, man. I learned a lot. And now I'm not going to be as intimidated to string that three hole. <laughs> <laughs> it's still, it's still gonna, it's still gonna mess with you. It's a, yeah, I, getting, I getting, getting the slack right. You just it's like, like use a little more than you think you need. It helps if you got strings that are long enough that you don't have to, you're not trying to like be super, uh, um, you know, dole them out like you don't. They only give you just barely enough to use. So, like, yeah. if you got extra slack, use it all on the, the tail end because that's where you're gonna need it. Oh, got you, got you. Oh man, well, this is fantastic, sir. Thank you very much, and uh, we will see each other again on the 16th for the workshop, right? And yep. and you're gonna teach us um, a bit on adjusting, yeah, and and string height and. Uh, talk about tension and all these different other things that matter that makes actually our playing a lot easier yeah and people don't realize how important that is yeah, um, yeah sure. for me like i said dude i'm you know i'm one of those guys that 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 you know oh man you know it's close to close to zero and when that saddle comes in man i swear to goodness there's barely anything left <laughs> hey you got it hey if it, if it works for you then it's like it's a, yeah it's all taken into account all, all the different ratios and everything but you can there's a lot of there's a lot of wiggle room when you get it from the factory you can play around with it like they're yeah. getting it ready for you know for anybody to customize it pretty much it's not usually dialed into where you got no space left to work with that's it so right. there's that's some right definitely tricks that's right especially with the call laws i know what the standards are so <laughs> yeah oh yeah for sure and you know and 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 the family over there they know exactly how tight i like it you know brian especially like dude take it you know you know he's like Jonah! and i'm like <laughs> 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 oh 
But all right, my brother. Well, thank you very much, bro, for hanging out with me and sharing uh, sharing your mana'o on stringing and how to string the various styles and super important. So anybody who is, you know, always people are always intimidated when it comes to stringing, you know. So um, I hope this video helps you guys. And thank you to Joel of Uke Logic. Um, Uke Logic are, you know, they are my favorite strings, hands down um so please go ahead and give them a try uh a lot of my people students friends family uh that's been uh playing with me now have been using his strings and they absolutely love it so i can tell you for a fact that they are fantastic strings uh to the point where they're practically all i use okay and that is no joke joel knows um and so yeah go ahead and try it out guys but brother joel thank you so much man how can we get in oh, touch yeah. with you man um so yeah if you need me um you can always reach me joel at ecologic.com okay um if you want to pick up strings direct i have a an etsy store that's just kind of a placeholder for now eventually i'll have a full website up but just you know until i got the time to do that you can uh even if you just go through Google, if you just type in Ukelogic, it's uh -huh. usually going to be the ukulele site where I sell, you know, most of them through because we have a lot of customers that are pairing it with their instruments or other things they're getting uh, through us there. So, yeah. um, you know, that's my day job. If you are getting something from us, you can usually reach me. I'm mostly the one picking up the phone too, or you know, you can shoot an email. But anything direct, Ukelogic related, you can always hit me up at uh, Joel at Ukelogic.com or through Etsy cool sounds good and you know and again and if you guys got any questions you can also reach me and i will shoot you over to joel as well um because joel is the man <laughs> the man no way man no way you... <laughs> <laughs> all right brother god bless you guys aloha no and we are out all right cheers